Thanks for joining us on Power Lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Good afternoon, I'm Meera Dugal. Let's get you the headlines. Indian markets gave up their morning gains, dragged by selling pressure in IT stocks. The Nifty continues to trade above the 11,250 mark. The RBI begins stocks with banks on another set of stressed accounts. The regulator has sent queries on whether lenders have classified accounts correctly and provided against them. The petrochemicals business helps Reliance Industries beat analyst estimate in the first quarter. ICSA Bank gains in trade as the street appreciates the cleanup act carried out in the first quarter. And Bank of Baroda is up nearly 10% after the lender posted better than expected June quarter earnings, a fall in provisions year on year as well. And on the par lunch today, repeated GST rate cuts are credited negative for India, wants Moody's. We're going to be talking to Gene Frank from the rating agency. Wait for another quarter to be sure of Bank of Baroda's fortunes. Uh, so says PS Jay Kumar in an exclusive interview. And veteran market investor Mark Mobius stresses on the need for better communication by central banks. We'll tell you all about it on the other side. All right, let's uh, kick it off by taking a look at the markets. About two tenths of a percent higher on the Sensex. Neeraj is here with the afternoon check. Afternoon, Neeraj. Hey, afternoon, guys. So banks are actually holding up the markets because, save for that, uh, we are in a spot of bother. Mm -hmm. But Nifty Bank up about 0.4 percent, led predominantly by the two corporate-facing banks, so ICICI Bank, SBI, are the two names which are really holding up uh, the Nifty Bank. Uh, keep in mind that some of the other smaller PSU banks too have done reasonably okay. Mm. I mean, if you just look at the uh, Nifty 500 or the Nifty 200 and the gainers there, a clutch of these PSU banking stocks have done really, really well for themselves. 3-4% the order of the day for a clutch of these mid-sized names. So that's doing okay. BOB, of course, up about 9%. I'm sure you guys will talk more about it, so won't dwell too much on this. But yeah, the, doing extremely well for itself in the session today. Uh, IT is in a spot of bother today and that's, trying, that's kind of negating the gains that we would have had. So it's CL Tech. Result Boy, now the third largest company by virtue of revenues, uh, is down about a percent and a half. Some of the others too, the likes of Infosys, Wipro, etc., all of them have come off. But par for the course, really nothing to worry about, just a small bit of a pullback after having a fairly decent last week as well. So that's looked slightly wobbly in the session today. Um, India VIX came off early part of uh, trade today. Again, just the start of the new series, very difficult to figure out what will happen in the course. But it just started off very low today and now about 5%, but um, you know, frankly nothing to write home about, uh, to be honest. So another, uh, another half decent day of trade, we are defying global queues. So most of the global markets, the European mar Asia, Asia started on a weak note. Europe has a bit of red on the screen. The Dow futures marginally lower. Mm. Banks, as I said, are helping us stay afloat. Interesting, Daniel. Thank you for that. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India, meanwhile, has initiated another review of provisioning made by various banks in lieu of all the stressed accounts in the system. Three bankers have told Bloomberg Quinn that the regulator has sought details from all lenders. Vishwanath is here with more details on this one. So, this is round number two. Uh, technically, round three, three. because it started in uh, FI 16. So, 16, 17, and now. For 18, uh, because the first two years you had recognition, that was an important part of mm. a three-pronged approach to uh, to deal with stressed assets. You know, first is rec recognition. You do uh, uh, some kind of resolution, and then you have some form of recovery. Mm. Uh, that that was primarily what Raghuram Rajan had said back then. So the recognition part is almost over. There are still a few accounts which may uh, show up uh, as fresh NPAs uh, during the cu current financial year. But the focus now is on provisioning because uh, when uh, you classify an account as an NPA the first year you provide about 15 percent and then as the years go by mm. uh, the following four years the provisioning keeps increasing if the account continues as an NPA and at the end of four years it's mm. become a full NPA and then you provide 100 percent for it. Uh, bankers are being asked questions about uh, certain accounts whether the provisioning matches uh, how these accounts should have been classified ideally. Mm. Um, remember when the SDR came out back in 2015 at that point in time bankers were asked uh, bankers were given an option to have an, have a standstill on accounts uh, you, you know you you have a standstill on uh, the account classification and therefore you own, do not pro do not necessarily provide for it that's how bankers understood it. Mm. The idea now is that if you are if the SDR failed and if uh, uh, subsequent restructurings fail, then ideally the account should have been classified as NPA before any of these uh, plans were implemented and therefore your provisioning should be backdated to that effect, which means that during this financial year again you will see profitability being affected significantly if the RBI actually decides to go, because remember this is still a discussion phase. Uh, finally the RBI will come up with a final order which will be sent across to banks depending on what the RBI says the banks will have to make requisite provisioning. That's what we are understanding. Okay, uh, Vishnu, a couple of questions. Uh, first follow up is that uh, from what you understand from your sources, each bank has been given an individual list of accounts, uh, so the actual total number of accounts may be fairly large. 
That's correct because uh, because you know some banks have about 50 accounts, some banks have 20, depending on where they are present mm -hmm. uh, and where they are required to hold some form of provisioning. They've been sent a list and asked asked for some kind of clarifications by the RBI. They, uh, and then of course, if you put all of these together. It's, it's a fairly large pool of stressed assets this time. Okay, and uh, most of this or at least some of this will be already in the NPA pool. So the impact of this round, you know, we are broadly calling it another review. It may not be exactly that. Yeah. Uh, would be more on provisioning than it would be on NPA Correct. numbers. So, so essentially on profitability rather than on the asset quality gross NPA number, uh, that may not move as, as drastically as expected. But, but, you know, the provisioning side, that, that's where the banks will be hit more. All right, Vishnu, thanks so much for that, uh, that story uh, that we've been playing out since the morning. You can go on to BloombergQuinn.com uh, and read more. Uh, the Indian economy, though, is showing some signs of a recovery. A cross-section of forward-looking indicators compiled by Bloomberg News uh, show largely positive signs. It also suggests that the world's fastest-growing major economy uh, can weather global trade tensions a little bit better and emerging market strains uh, that have been developing as well. Anirban Nag of Bloomberg News joins us uh, with those charts. Anirban, what are the charts saying? Well, the charts are saying basically the services and the manufacturing sectors are holding up pretty well. Mm. Uh, what that means is that the RBI has um, uh, has some things to do here, especially given that they've moved into a uh, tightening uh, cycle. Mm. Um, ex exports are, hold, uh, are, are reviving, uh, bank loans are reviving. So um, the only thing that's not reviving are the capital intensive uh, sectors so uh, those are the thing that that's the risk um, to the economy but more and more what the rbi probably will look at is uh, the closing output gap uh, we also of course have a policy coming up so you know on the one hand you have the closing output gap slight you know higher degree of confidence in the growth side and then you have inflation so where are we how are we setting up for the policy well look I, you know, the, the way i think the rbi especially the hawks within the rbi will look at it is is this, this closing output gap is likely to fuel more inflationary pressures uh, whether uh, it's demand side uh, demand push or mm. supply side that's another argument but right now it looks like that closing output gap as well as demand uh, plus the msp uh, price hike that is likely to uh, kick into the second half is likely to see the RBI grow a little bit more hawkish and keep the rate hike very much on the table. Arifat, thanks so much for that. GST rate cuts are credit negative for India, says Modi's investor service, as they worried that it will weigh on the government's fiscal consolidation efforts. Remember, the rating agency had upgraded India in November 2017, citing a host of reforms. Among them was GST, which Modi believed then would expand the tax base. However, Repeated GST cuts are now turning uh, are turning Moody's cautious. Uh, to, to talk about this a little more in detail, Gene Fang on uh, on the phone line, managing director of uh, the financial institutions group at Moody's Investor Services. Gene, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, what's your concern? What is the reason you believe that these rate cuts are credit negative? Well, I think it's important to say that we still think the government's fiscal targets for the year are achievable, but uh, these uh, GST cuts do continue to uh, put downward pressure on revenues, and we think altogether the risks are more uh, on the downside, that the government may miss the, uh, the fiscal targets for this year, um, these GST tax cuts uh, being one of the drivers there. Uh, Jean, can you just uh, sort of, uh, you know, give us a sense of how this changes, if at all, your view on India's rating? Uh, you were, you know, the only of the three large agencies which upgraded India, and one of the factors you cited in there uh, was optimism that GST would lead to a wider tax base, stronger collections. Does this in any way change that view? Um, overall, we still have a stable outlook on the India's sovereign credit. Uh, we continue to maintain that uh, stable outlook, and we think altogether GST has been positive. Uh, we've already seen some of the early um, early implementation problems getting worked out, uh, so we think GST is operating more smoothly now than it was uh, uh, earlier this year or a year ago. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we think that the overall f fiscal targets are still achievable. Uh, we just we just recognize that uh, these GST reductions are having some downward pressure. We do think that those downward pressures might be offset by the fact that the GST is also being uh, the GST is also including some um, some.
some uh, advances in terms of simplifying the tax code, and that could have a offsetting effect of broadening the tax base um, that would contribute to, again, um, some positive offsets to uh, the, the cuts in GST rates. The other variable has been rising oil prices, Gene. If you just take the GST out of the equation for a moment, do you believe that the fiscal math are on track uh, given the rise, high, I mean, higher oil prices this year? Um, we think the rise in oil prices largely has a, uh, a limited direct impact on the government's fiscal position. Um, we do note that diesel and gasoline prices have already been deregulated, so um, that's certainly one, um, one benefit that we would say that there's less fiscal pressure from rising oil prices directly. Um, that being said, we do think that there could be, um, could be uh, broader pressures on, on economic growth from, from rising oil prices prices, which certainly aren't good. But fundamentally, we do think that the risks of rising oil prices are to some extent contained for the sovereign. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's part and parcel of our stable outlook. Uh, Gene, you talk about it, the expenditure side as well, cautioning that uh, you know, there could be upside risks on the expenditure targets. Uh, you mentioned uh, the new minimum support prices that have been announced. Uh, so you know, if you uh, juxtapose that with the uh, revenue shortfalls which could come through, uh, you know, there, is, there is downside risk to the fiscal deficit target. Yeah, there is some downside risk. Um, we think the targets are still achievable, but uh, again, I think that um, we do see more downside risks on the horizon. Um, uh, that being said, I think that the rating overall is not going to be driven by one, um, one fiscal target. Uh, I think we are looking more longer term at the um, whole package of reforms and the ability of those reforms to have a positive benefit uh, in the medium to long term. Sure, but you also talk about the fact that the debt to GDP numbers are well ahead of uh, you know what the peer group has, uh, and uh, given the kind of sort of fiscal uh, consolidation that we have undertaken, uh, perhaps an expectation of a near-term downside in the debt to GDP ratios is also limited. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been a feature of, uh, of India's economy for a long time. The debt affordi affordability and uh, debt burden ratios are very high relative to peers of the BAA level. But um, we do think that uh, any um, ability to manage that down will be uh, a medium-term project. Uh, we're not looking for one year's, uh, to, one year's results to uh, immediately make the difference. Um, but I think our midterm, um, medium-term view is that the reform packages will have a positive effect on bringing those down over time. All right, Gene, we leave it there. Thank you so much, Anthony, for joining us. Gene, thank for Moody's Investor Services talking about the GST tax cuts and the impact that it's having on ratings. They have, uh, they've called it credit negative. All right, let's move on. Deal activity has picked up pace in India. Transactions worth close to $100 billion have been inked in 2018. The Walmart Flipkart deal, for example, helped the investment bank uh, JP Morgan reclaim the top spot in the M&A league table this year. Anto is here, Anto Anthony from Bloomberg News, to tell us more about this on which sectors have really attracted the interest and more about the deal activity. Anto. Oh, that's right, Harsha, as you pointed out, the deal activity in India has touched a record, 98 billion as of now. And mostly these deals are driven by the overseas inbound deals, which specifically in the sectors of telecom, media, technology, and also some financial services. Mm. As you pointed out, Walmart deal, which a 16 billion Walmart deal is what really pushes this to a record. Mm. But even when we are looking, where we are sitting right now, and when we are looking at it, we can see several multi-billion deals in the offing. Mm. We are, GSK has the India business on block, which is worth more than three billion. Then uh, Kraft has Comline on block, which is worth a billion. Uh, also, in terms of outbound, outbound builds, some activities picking up this month. It's also two huge deals, which is the UPL and Novalis deal, which are the highest, highest and the second highest deal in the outbound space. So it looks like this would be a blockbuster year in terms of deal and several, uh, several more multi-million deals on the offering. JP Morgan seemed to be on top of the table. They were nowhere last year. Uh, what did their CV, CEO have to say? Yeah, JP Morgan was not in the top for a very long time, mm. at, least, at least since 2001, according to our data. Uh, obviously, the deal which pushed them to the top is the Walmart deal. Uh, and they were also part of several deals like Internet, Blackstone, and so on. So they see you saying that TMT, uh, the telecom, media, and technology, and financial services is going to be what is pushing. Mm. And because this is going to be an year more of inbound deals, uh, where JP Morgan obviously has a uh, high hand and also the, uh, some bankruptcy consolidation happening. So these two segments will be driving the deals this year mm. and JP Morgan is well placed to lead the pack. All right, Anto, thanks so much for that.
Let's move into earnings. Reliance Industries uh, banked on its petrochemical business to uh, see it through the first quarter. Uh, the refining to telecom giant beats street estimates with its capex spend uh, starting to pay dividends. Samit so Sarkar is here uh, to uh, tell us what stood out uh, from the Reliance numbers which have been out for a day or so. Well, the first thing that stood out was the Reliance Industries' gross refining margin. Now, they, that came in at around 10.5 US dollars per barrel, which is lower compared to last quarter. But that is because the Asian benchmark, that is the Singapore gross refining margin, that also averaged lower at around 6 dollars per barrel in the first quarter of financial year 2018, as compared to 7 dollars per barrel last year. However, Reliance Industries' premium to the gro Singapore gross refining margin, now that expanded to 4.5 dollars. US uh, per, per barrel on the back of the ethane imports and favorable crude sourcing and because of ramping up of new plants. Also, this is the 14th consecutive quarter where the company has been able to maintain a double-digit gross refining margin. The second was the petrochemical business. Now, the revenue from the petchem business grew around 6%, a bit jumped 22% on the back of higher spreads and the stronger volumes. Margins also expanded by 260 basis points and this chart here shows how Petchem business is now very important for Reliance Industries. Now, the Petchem EBIT contributes nearly 50% to the consolidated EBIT of Reliance Industries and this, has, and this has been rising for the company. Last year it contributed around 35% which has now increased to 50% in the first quarter of financial year 2019. Lastly, it was the retail business. Now, the retail, though retail segment contributes only 7% to the consolidated EBIT of Reliance Industries, the growth rate has been stellar in this part. The retail, EBIT, retail, retail segment's EBIT has seen a triple digit growth for the last four consecutive quarters. In the second quarter of financial year 2018, it grew at a rate of around 106% compared to last quarter, then followed by a growth rate of 111%, then 291%, and in this quarter compared to last year, the retail EBIT grew around 266% on the back of the store expansion plans of the company. What about, sorry, what about Geo or something? For Reliance Geo, if you see the average revenue per user, now it has fallen for the third consecutive quarter, but the reported average revenue per user of 135 rupees was way above the analyst estimates. Analysts were expecting uh, ARPO of around 125 to 127 rupees, but the company reported an ARPO of 135. And the factors that aided to such an outperformance in terms of ARPO, first it was the fact that 88 to 90 percent of the geo phone users are on the higher ARPU plans, that is the 153 rupees plan, and not the 49 rupees plan. Unlike the street, uh, street, uh, unlike the street, what was estimating. Second is three to four percent of the total subscribers of Reliance Geo is on the higher ARPU plan, that is the 779 rupees plan, which also aided the ARPU. And third was the fact that higher video consumption, which led to higher add-on recharges during the IPL and the football World Cup phase, which which uh, increased the ARPU of the company in the first quarter of financial year. 2019. Lastly, few other things that stood out in this earnings was the postpaid plan in which Reliance Geo focused in the first quarter. Now that has around 4 million subscribers which is close to 2% of the total subscriber base of the company. The capital expenditure for Reliance Geo in the first quarter stood at around 17,000 crore rupees which is double than what Bharti et al spent. The debt of Reliance Geo, total debt of Reliance Geo is close to 1,48,000 crore rupees which is 61% of Reliance Industries consolidated debt. And the churn on the performance side, if you see, for Reliance Geo, the churn rate was the lowest in the industry at 0.3%. And the data usage per customer per month should increase to 10.6 GB in the first quarter. So, I mean, thank you so much for that. <coughs> Let's move on. ICIC Bank unexpectedly reported a loss in the first quarter, but this was largely because the private lender decided to increase provisions. The bank also saw a drop in slippage as expected. Shraddha is standing by to explain the numbers of ICIC Bank this quarter. Well, yes, so it was a net loss of 120 crores during the quarter and that was despite the uh, 1100 crore uh, stake monetization support coming in. This is a 2% stake sale in ICICI uh, Prudential Life that they did during the quarter. Uh, so that's because we saw the provisions remaining elevated at about 6000 crores. Uh, why is that so? Well, they have taken an entire um, M2M uh, hit of 218 crores in this quarter. They've made additional provisioning of about 700 crores towards NCLT account. 248 towards fraud accounts which were uh, recognized in the previous quarter so now they've reversed the debit they have put it in the reserves and surplus in the last quarter so that has flown into the PNL and overall they've also increased the uh, provision coverage ratio by 560 basis points sequentially to 66.1% and that is being seen as a positive. Uh, even if you look at the core operating performance, the core operating profit of the bank uh, grew about 
percent, the highest that we have seen in about uh, eight quarters now. Even in terms of the asset quality that remains steady, the gross NPA numbers saw a marginal improvement to 9.65 percent, and gross slippages uh, came back to about 4,000 crores, so back to normalized uh, levels that we had seen before the March quarter, which was of course an anomaly because of that RBI circular uh, business momentum. Uh, that also continued for the bank. Uh, loan growth came in at 11.3 percent. That's again a five or six quarter high. Retail loans uh, now have risen to about 58 percent of the books. That was another thing that was seen as positive. Uh, even if you look at um, the management commentary, the, uh, the newly appointed COO, uh, Sandeep Bakshi, said that the bank had voluntarily complied with all requests from the U.S. regulator. He was talking about uh, queries raised by the U.S. SEC after uh, SEBI had also raised them. And uh, secondly, he also said that uh, the report on incorrect asset classification with respect to those 34, 31 bad loan accounts, uh, the report said that that would not have any material impact on FY18 financial, so allowing at least uh, fears to some extent. So overall, uh, the fact that there was uh, not too much fresh accretion to the NPAs and the fact that provision coverage improvement uh, preceded earnings is what led to the kind of uh, share price reaction that we are seeing on ICSA today. What have brokerages made of these numbers, Shraddha? Uh, well, uh, they have maintained their uh, outlook as well as target price. Uh, starting off with quota uh, for which the bank remains a top pick, they've said that the results broadly suggest that there is some gradual recovery and especially uh, with respect to the NPL stabilization uh, but they have pointed out that the bank needs to address the non-financial issues for it to re-rate further from here. Uh, next on the list I believe is uh, Goldman Sachs again they have said that they remain bullish they maintain a buy with a target price of 375. Uh, they see uh, more confidence on the asset quality of the bank and they believe that the growth will pick up from here onwards. Uh, they also see uh, positive in the fact that the bank has uh, ensured it's uh, insulated from this in ongoing inquiry uh, with respect to MD and CEO Chanda Kocher. Uh, you also have CLSE which has said that they are encouraged uh, to see moderation in the slippages. So they believe that better asset quality and rise in the ROA will drive re-rating from here onwards. So again, a retained buy and target price of 430. And finally, a Macquarie, which has also maintained its target price at 416. In fact, they've stressed on the fact that given the retail loans are about 58%, uh, it won't be too long before ICLCI Bank is uh, addressed as a retail bank uh, as opposed to a corporate bank right now. And they believe that the core uh, price to book value of 1.1 at uh, the current levels of first comfort on the risk and uh, reward uh, ratio. So overall, uh, they, most of the brokerages see valuations at least as undemanding. And that's the reason for the kind of outlook and target price that we see. All right, uh, let's move on to Bank of Baroda. Uh, shares of Bank of Baroda up 10% after earnings were released on Friday. The bank reported stable asset quality trends. Provisions fell year on year as the bank has already a provision ahead of the curve. Uh, but uh, the CEO, P.S. Jayakumar, is saying that he is wanting to wait for another couple of quarters before he can actually claim victory over this bad loan problem. Listen in uh, to that conversation with Dishnath Nair. The data is clearly evidencing uh, the, the turn, as it is a turnaround, we looked at it from every dimension. That said, uh, it would be good for us to wait for one more quarter uh, just to make sure that all the assumptions actually roll out. But clearly, we are in a better position today relative to what we were at the end of last quarter as evidenced by growth, profitability, revenues, uh, the the way the NPA numbers themselves are moving, the provision coverage ratio across all dimensions, we are in a much more comfortable, uh, comfortable place, and the business is humming from all cylinders. Maybe uh, because this is a question that we keep asking every quarter, but the stress is an important bit of of banking uh, in the current scenario. On the stress side, what is the situation looking like? Are we in fully, fully in control at this point in time, unless pending any negative surprises later on? I think, uh, as we were explaining, bulk of these slippages that we have seen today, this quarter, uh, comes from a watch list. Simultaneous to that, we have seen a reduction in the SME levels 1 and 2 considerably, as measured by the proportion of the ANR. Uh, you know, a couple of NCLT decisions are expected to get implemented this quarter. We have sold some asset post balance sheet event in July, a steel asset. Uh, 
some amount of slippages are bound to be there. But when you take all of it together, it does seem to us that downside risk from this point of time to the overall gross NPA number in absolute terms and the overall net NPA numbers in absolute terms seems to be reasonably contained. Uh, we cannot for sure say there won't be any increase, but even if it is, it will be in a very manageable limit. And we are sure that it will catch up during the course. I mean, will it will improve back again during the course of this year. So as we project into March, it does look that uh, that things are very contained. But as you rightly pointed out, there have been surprises in the past, and there could be surprises in the future. The integrator agreement, and that was something that you uh, worked on closely with the, with the Sunil Mehta Committee. Uh, the approach of having one single large lender leading the charge as far as resolution goes, um, it eliminates that, that whole idea that there's too much debate leads to no real result. Uh, but also, the problem is that people may find it uh, as, as stifling some of the smaller banks or their voices or their opinion in the matter. Because because if 66% of the 60% of the lenders agree to something, then it just goes past. Uh, would you say that smaller lenders are being shortchanged? Not really. It could also uh, the. The people who do not want to accept the resolution process that is being recommended by the lead bank have an option to exit based on a certain predefined formula or have an option to buy out the lead bank share if they choose to. So, you know, there is an alternative available as well. But look at it this way, that uh, we have got to resolve the problems. Sometimes the smaller institutions can take a much more aggressive position because they have less to lose as a matter of fact. So we also had those situations as well. Uh, so I would say that uh, we're all hoping that the experiences that we've had over the last several years now has resulted in an increase in the maturity curve of all of us will result in much more appropriate decision. Also, there is a process of having a kind of a board uh, that the IBA would set up, which would also be able to review the decisions that are being made. All in all, I think there are some checks and balances overall that is there. But the important thing is to get ahead with the resolution, complete and move on. And uh, that will result in releasing of capital and liquidity uh, and reducing the non-earning asset, which is good for everybody. That's the management of Bank of Baroda. Visa issues aside, the top four tech companies in terms of market size have managed to put up a good show uh, in the June ended quarter. Agam is here with, uh, with the key takeaways of Indian IT. It looks like... They're at least getting out of the woods right now. Agam. Right, Harsha. So, uh, if well, at this point in time, it does seem like from the parameters that I've chosen, TCS is the clear winner when you consider the performance of the top four IT companies. Uh, let's start off with the constant currency a growth on a sequential basis. And TCS not only has it come up with a 4.1% growth on sequentially, which is much higher than Infosys, HCL, uh, or uh, Wipro for that matter, but it's also come ahead of consensus. Whereas for the other three, Infosys, HCL Technologies, and Wipro, it's largely in line. And among the other factors that have actually played out uh, and, you know, in terms of growth is recovery in financial services vertical. This is a common factor. And the other one is uh, recovery in North America. America is specifically considering it is the largest markets for all these four companies. How about the guidance? Well, uh, TCS does not give out guidance, but the management has suggested a double-digit growth for the rest of the year. That's an indication. Infosys, of course, uh, we, we do know it's around 68%. They maintain that is the same for HCL Technologies, between 9.5% to 11.5%. And Wipro, on the other hand, for the second quarter, that's, that's the guidance, is slightly ahead of expectations. So uh, on the whole, is Wipro does have a little bit of an edge. And if you leave aside TCS, which is indicating a double-digit growth for this financial year. Let's move on and uh, take a look at the other key variable in this case. It is your, your, your margins. And as you can see here, as, as against the expectations of a 100 basis points contraction, TCS has only contracted by around 40 basis points. Infosys did see a decline of around 1% when it comes to its margins. HCL Technologies has actually seen an expansion of around 10 basis points, but this is because of the fact that its wage hikes will come into play in the second quarter. So that impact will play against HCL Technologies in Q2. Wipro, of course, the only reason why we've seen that up move in your margins is because of the 
fact that they've taken some provisioning in the base quarter owing to some certain client uh, uh, world bankruptcies. And that's the reason why we are looking at that up move. And well, normalcy resume for Wipro. But um, that said, how, after considering all these factors, how do these stack up in terms of street view? So as you can see, TCS is still the most expensive of all these. And Infosys, after the kind of growth that we've seen in this price over the previous few weeks, it has caught up around 19 times, but well, not as much as TCS, because TCS continues to be right at the pole position. ATL Technologies, interestingly, is the cheapest of all four. And it also has the highest return potential of all four, 13% from current market levels. And this is where TC, ACL Technologies actually stands out. Do remember that uh, your guidance is of uh, essentially double digit. Uh, I know the lower end of the guidance is around 9.5%, but it's essentially double digit. And Wipro, of course, as we all know, it has been really under a lot of pressure owing to certain uh, client bankruptcies and a lot of operational issues. Uh, at this point in time, while it, the, the variables on Q1 is where TC stands out as far as return potential and valuations are concerned it is HCL technologies and that's how we are seeing uh, the top four IT companies stack up when it comes to Q1 at this point in time. All right, Agam, thanks uh, for that. Uh, let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, Mark Mobis calls for better communication from central banks. We'll get your slice of that conversation. Back on lunch, the headlines at this hour. Markets extend their record run held by gains in Reliance Industries and ICICI Bank. TCNS Clothing slips into the red after making a tepid debut on the bosses. Axis Bank, HDFC and Tech Mahindra are some of the companies coming, coming out of quarterly earnings today. And the second phase of the popular Unified Payments Interface, UPI, is set to launch close to the second week of August. All right, quick closer look at how the markets are faring. Agam is here with some of the stocks that have been moving in the last 30 minutes. Agam? Well, uh, lifetime highs for the benchmarks right now. Uh, Nifty at around 11,300. It's the same for the Sensex too. Both advancing by as much as three tenths of a percent. And a large part of these gains are on the back of the banking index, led largely by ICICI Bank and SBI. That's also the reason why your Nifty banking index is up as much as six tenths of a percent. But uh, when you consider the broader markets too, uh, well, they're moving largely in tandem with the major indices, uh, say for the small cap index, which is actually outperforming uh, the broader market and the small cap index is up as much as six tenths of a percent. In terms of uh, some sectoral indices, well, it is the PSU banking index. Uh, the only index which is losing out last Friday is actually now the biggest gainer in today's day of trade, as I've mentioned, uh, on largely account of gains in SBI and Bank of Baroda. And other than that, we do have gains in something like Bharti Airtel and uh, Axis Bank as well. Of course, Axis Bank, uh, or rather ICICI Bank, is right at the top of the gainers list of when it comes to the indices. On the losing end, we do have some weakness in HCL technologies where uh, the revenues were perhaps a notch below uh, street expectations, but uh, it was the profitability which beat, uh, which, which did come ahead of consensus. HGFC Bank and Hindalco, among some others, which are looking at profit taking. But uh, the key takeaway and uh, the focus in today's day will remain with the benchmark index, uh, specifically uh, the Nifty in this case, which is currently trading at around 11,300 and at lifetime highs. All right, Agam, thanks so much. That's a market check. Policy decisions can often send global markets into a tizzy. To counter this, Mark Mobus believes that central banks must lay out a policy blueprint so that investors can plan accordingly. In a conversation with Bloomberg News, uh, he talks about the global economy, central banks and their impact on emerging markets. Listen in. It's always a dangerous game that the central banks play, and they're always criticized for being too late or being too early. But the bottom line is that with the uncertainty, then the market has troubles. They begin to think, well, gee, if they're raising now, they're going to probably keep on raising, and it may go up in the U.S. to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. So what the central bank should be doing is laying out a program saying, look, this is what we're going to be doing, when are we going to be doing it, so that everybody can plan accordingly. But that's not the way it works. No, exactly. <laughs> and, and the thing is, they hang on every word people exactly, do, don't they? Exactly. And the problem is a lot of these decisions are based on very faulty statistics. For example, inflation. The inflation numbers are all over the place. I mean, the way they, they uh, gather inflation numbers is very questionable. Exactly. And the things in, <laughs> in that basket 
seem sometimes to be questioned about their relevance to modern life. Absolutely, exactly. And of course, at the end of the day, okay, you're comparing apples and oranges because you're ch constantly changing this index, the weighting of the index of different products, and they forget about the impact of technology. I believe that we're in a... A sharing economy, the impact of that. Yep. The, we're in a deflationary situation globally because of technology. Prices are actually going down for so many things. Take, for example, the impact of Uber and DD and all these other services on transportation. Just one example. Price of computers coming down. Prices of cell phones. <laughs> Can you believe it? in India they're selling smartphones for, I think, 25 US. Smartphone. Are they intelligent yeah. smartphones? That's the question. <laughs> this is Mark, I'm going to bring Heidi in. She's uh, okay, in Sydney. Right. Yeah, Mark, I'm wondering, do you think the Fed should be yes. making decisions, policy decisions, based on Friday's GDP report? We saw the president and his supporters really claiming that as a big win. No, absolutely not. Because you have a situation where uh, you're uh, in a, where you're, okay, the numbers here are 4%, right? But next year, you're not going to get that 4% because you're going to compare what is happening next year to the 4% now. So it'll be very difficult to surpass the 4% number, if you know what I mean. So uh, you've got to be very careful about making a decision on these short-term numbers, which may not last. In fact, almost guaranteed not to last. Very unlikely the U.S. will get the 5, 6, 7% growth that you're seeing in China or India. Um, we had this uh, call out from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, saying given the Facebook sell-off uh, last week, that it's sort of an extension of a sign of a peaking in, in the FANG stock, so shorting FANGs in the second half and getting back into emerging markets. Is it time to get back into emerging markets or is this sell-off still got sort of deeper to go yet? Well, as you know, I've been saying that we expected about a 30% decline and we're now 20-odd percent down in emerging markets, depending on which index you look at. So I expect a little bit more because of this interest rate fears that you have. And of course, as I've said many times before, interest rates don't necessarily make a market. You can have interest rates going up and the market going up. So it's not a very good uh, indicator. But the reality is that investors get very fearful when they see these interest rates uh, moving up. And I believe this is the problem with these tech stocks, these stocks that are been flying high on the back of very, very, almost no interest rates at all. I mean, if you look at the euro, you've been in a negative territory if you were saving in euro. So now it's really going to become a big test for these tech stocks, particularly those that have been selling with no earnings at all and just uh, uh, going on the basis well, of no buy goals. That was Amazon for years, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I don't want to dwell on tech stocks at the moment because I want to move back to emerging markets and also looking at these central banks too. The Reserve Bank of India has been urged to hike interest rates this week. Now, in an economy which is structurally where it is and where it is in the economic history cycle and the dialectic process of that, do actually interest rates make a huge difference? I think they should lower interest rates in India, not raise them. Because the, you've but got is to, monetary policy really effective in a, in a structured economy like that? I don't think so, because uh, in India you have many states, different economic situations all over the country, which are quite widely dispersed. Say that about the U.S. In the U.S. to a great extent, but to a lesser extent than India. In India you really got real differences, you know, different languages, different uh, ways of living and so forth and so on. So I think uh, it would be a big mistake for them to raise. I would like to see them lower rates because then they will have more investment. Mark, within the EM space, is, is Turkey really the biggest basket case right now? And do you see any concern <laughs> about contagion, in particular when it comes to European banks? I think Turkey is in a very, very interesting position now because, the, uh, as you know, the currency has gone really down dramatically. The market is down as well, partly because of the currency in U.S. dollar terms, but also because of the negative... Uh, uh, news we're getting out of uh, Turkey. But at the end of the day, it's a big economy. They're great companies in Turkey. Uh, I was just there last month and I visited some companies that are doing very well. Of course, there'll be some liabilities, some problems going forward. But I think uh, Turkey is a place we want to look at now. Uh, I'm just looking here at the Turkish lira and what it's done this century. 
right? Since 2000. <laughs> it has depreciated. Depre the dollar has appreciated. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It's gone depreciated. Yeah, exactly. You can't depreciate 630%. It, the, the dollar has appreciated by 630%. Currency risk is your biggest problem, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. In emerging markets, currency is a really a big opportunity as well as a problem. Because if you see a very, very undervalued currency, there's a chance for you to make a bundle. Because, you know, you're going to see this currency buying a lot more with U.S. dollars than you were doing before. A good example is you go uh, to Johor from Singapore. Prices are half or one third. You know the currency is undervalued and there's opportunity. So this is the kind of thing we like to look at. Mark, if, if currency risk is your biggest risk within that EM space, you look at the US dollar, a good news story, it, it ends up strengthening. A bad news story, which is the trade story, it ends up strengthening as well. So you know, under what circumstances do you see weakness going forth for the, for the greenback? Well, by the way, currency is not necessarily the biggest risk. I mean, if we're investing in equities, uh, probably the biggest risk is the management of the company, the ownership. What are they doing to the company? Because a good company can take advantage of the currency problem. So if you're an exporter and you're in Turkey, you're going to do very well. In fact, I believe Turkey will now do much better on exports uh, because a lot of the business from China will be shifted to Turkey, to Vietnam, to these other emerging market countries that can compete with a very cheap currency and low labor costs, low, low other costs. Uh, but looking beyond that, what we do is we say, look, uh, what is the situation longer term in a particular country? Uh, let's not look at the short term situation and which companies will be able to survive this situation because chances are they'll be among the few companies that can survive the situation and do very well because under those circumstances they take market share, they grow faster and so forth. So it's, a, it's really a matter of the, not only the currency but the company as well. Mark Mobius, he believes India should be cutting interest rates and not raising them. Let's talk about IPOs now. Women's apparel maker TCNS Clothing listed on the bourses today at a 6% discount to the issue price. The W brand owner is confident that the company's growth prospects. Uh, in a conversation with Charlene, the manager director of the company, Anand Daga, spoke about expanding the product portfolio and adding new brands. The market space that we operate in is a very, very exciting space. It's ethnic women's wear, wherein you have a lot of movement from sari to non sari customers. You have movement from unbranded to branded. It's a space that also doesn't have any foreign competition. There are a handful of national brands. I think TC and this clothing company with the strength of having a multi-brand, multi-channel business with a proven retail and product model is very, very well poised to ride on this growth wave. And I think in coming years, you'll see good growth. Okay. Sir, I understand that you know, you're restricted to a certain extent with revealing your, your growth rates that you expect. But you know, I think, can we say around 39 to 40% or 45% is what you're looking at? If you could just give us an indication on that front. No, I think any, any indication on that side won't be possible from our end. But I think, again, if you'll just look at the market, dissect it and look at our thing, I think you'll be able to find reasonable levels at which we can grow. Uh, also, can you give us a little more of an idea about your revenue split? Because, you know, you see a majority of your revenues come from W. Right. And, uh, you know, will this change? Because you have been bringing down the lev your exposure from W and it's moving on to Aurelia and to Wishful. Uh, do we see this continuing? Do we see Aurelia's uh, uh, contribution to revenue increasing over a period of time? If you look at our business model, we are a multi-brand business, we are a fashion platform and it's always an idea to us, for us to have multiple brands at different growth stage. W is our most uh, stable brand, Aurelia is a slightly younger brand and Wishful is something we started focusing last two years. So if you look at it, there are different growth rates, they have different shares. W today is 57%, it used to be a much higher share. So of course as we keep adding brands and all the brands start getting matured, I think the percentages would get more distributed. And how many brands do you plan to add in the next two to three years? Because now you have around three. What, what are we expecting on that front? See, as an organization, we have always had very, very selective focus. We have always believed in focusing on one brand and growing it. And once we see stability there, we incubate more brand. So I don't think I can put a number to how many brands. But yes, once we have Wishful in a more stabilized manner, you'll, in all probability, you can see us exploring another brand. 
Okay. And uh, in what space do we see that, uh, you know, in what price range and also are you going to look at uh, accessories because that's something you've also talked about. Uh, we see it in which space really and what is the price range of that brand? So uh, as a company, what we understand is the women's wear business and that's the space that uh, we guys are going to operate in. There are very exciting opportunities on ethnic side or probably even a slightly more Indianized version of Western wear. There could be accessory brand. All these are possibilities and I think given our expertise, we can explore any of these areas. So depending upon the right target, depending upon the right timing, we might decide on the strategy. Also, can you elaborate a little more on your expansion plans? Uh, because, you know, within the country you have reached a certain scale. And uh, does that limit your expansion going ahead? And geographically, where do we see you going ahead? Uh, which are the other countries that you're looking at? See, I think we all think India is much smaller than what it is. And we are just we just have 465 stores. All our brands are in very nascent stage. We see a lot of growth opportunities across geographies, across channels. In terms of new stores, we plan to add 75 to 85 new stores every year for next few years and that I think is a definite possibility. Apart from that we also want to explore international market. We already have few stores in Mauritius, Sri Lanka, Nepal. So that's again a market which is there for having. Okay, but if you could elaborate a little more on the other markets that you're looking to expand into? So it's typically the markets which have Indian diaspora, which has similar seasonal uh, patterns. So it could be your Middle East, it could be Southeast, it could be pockets of US, Canada, these kind of markets. Okay. And also if you could elaborate on your various, uh, your present to various, uh, you know, MBOs and exclusive business outlets and also to the e-commerce space uh, and also large stores, which is which has higher margins in uh, from all these uh, various uh, areas of distribution of your products? See, for us, all these channels are extremely profitable and there's tremendous growth opportunity. Uh, since we have not shared this data in RHP, I won't be able to share details. But yes, on and, on and all, all these are very, very attractive avenues to grow business and very profitable. Okay. And also, can you give us an idea or some guidance on your margin expansion going ahead? Because you've grown pretty well in the last few years. So uh, do we expect this growth rate to continue even on the margin front? Uh, I'm sorry, but again, this is a futuristic question. But uh, if you look at our margins, I think we are in some other sweet, sweet uh, spot. If you look at our peers who are mostly in unlisted space in a similar product category, you'll find us to be somewhere in the middle. In the middle. So I think these margins are pretty sustainable. And depending upon the stage of growth we are, these can move uh, somewhat. Okay. All right, we're getting back to earnings. Uh, two financial sector names that we're watching out for, HTFC Limited uh, and Access Bank. Shadda standing by with a quick check on what we expect from those. Shadda. Uh, I'm going to start off with HDFC where, uh, you know, higher dividend income is expected to boost earnings for this uh, mortgage lender. So you have uh, uh, the dividend income from HDFC Bank last year was booked in the second quarter and this year it's in the first quarter and hence the base would look lower this year. So net profit growth is seen 39% higher at 2167 crores. Uh, that apart, margins are expected to compress uh, slightly about 10 basis points on a sequential basis. Loan growth should continue at about 17 to 18% and overall asset quality trends are expected to remain steady for HDFC Limited. When it comes to Axis Bank, it's expected to swing back into a profit in this quarter after its um, uh, first ever quarterly loss in the March ended quarter, even as credit costs normalize. So uh, loan growth is expected to come in at about 16%. Fresh NPL formation is expected to again uh, normalize because most of the stress, uh, analysts believe, was upfronted in the fourth ended quarter. Cross slippage is a number is expected anywhere between 4,000 to 7,000 crores as compared to 15 16,000 crores in the uh, March ended quarter. Uh, but most importantly for Axis Bank, uh, what is going to be important to watch out for is going to be the movement of the sub investment grade portfolio. Any slippages outside of watch list and the management will continue uh, with their guidance of credit cost normalization in the second half of FI19. We'll have to see if there is any change in that or not. And finally, what the markets will be looking out for will be the succession plan for the outbound CEO. Shikar Sharma's term expires on 31st December. So that's another thing to keep track of. Brother, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to be talking about IT major tech Mahindra that will be reporting numbers today. Uh, Agam, uh, analysts are pricing in a muted growth this time? 
Yes, so we are expecting major growth from Tech Mahindra. We're expecting about near 2% growth when it comes to the top line, but there should be severe margins contraction seen at around 12.3% against 13.8% sequentially. Consequently, profits could fall 27% to around 896 crores. Among the few factors that the street is uh, you know, discounting in its earnings at this point in time with respect to anticipation is a high base and a weak quarter for Comviva it's a key subsidiary uh, that, that should bear down on the top line. We have further seasonal weakness in the telecom vertical to which will contribute to the decline as well. The enterprise segment is expected to remain largely flattish and with respect to the, uh, the, the contraction and margins about 70 basis points depreciation will come on account of decline in uh, visa costs and the other 70 basis points will be largely on account of wage hikes that, that will come into play. What are we keeping an eye on? Well commentary and timelines on 5G implementations by the various governments across uh, the key markets for t t t uh, Tech Mahindra. Out to outlook on the network business and let's not forget plans and updates on uh, Tech M Next initiative that the company has spoken about in the previous uh, couple of quarters. But on the whole, we're not expecting a very good quarter from Tech Mahindra going in. All right, uh, thanks for that. A combination of higher costs and low pricing power is expected to have hurt interglobe aviation in the first quarter. Somit Sarkar is standing by with what the street is pricing it. Somit. So Interglobe Aviation, the parent company of Indigo, is expected to report a weak set of numbers in the first quarter of financial year 2019. Now, though revenue of the company is expected to be high by around 17% to close to 6,700 crore rupees, the EBITDA, that is the earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization and rental costs is expected to be lower by around 27%. Margins are also expected to contract sharply to 21%, while the net profit of the company is expected to fall 37% to close to 514 crore rupees. Now, the quarter is expected to be weak on the back of lower ticket prices, weaker rupee and higher fuel prices. However, some of these negatives will be offset by high utilization levels and strong passenger growth. Now, passenger load factor, that is the utilization level, averaged around 90.4% in the first quarter as against 88.6% last year, while the passenger growth was around 20% for the airline company compared to last year. Now, on the negative side, average ticket prices are expected to be low by around 7%, thereby putting pressure on the yields of the company. Now, for an airline company, 30 to 40% of the total cost is fuel cost and in first quarter fuel prices by higher by around 27 percent aviation turbine fuel prices average around 67,000 rupees per kiloliter as against 50 uh, 52,700 rupees last year to add to this indian currency was also weaker against the u.s dollars in the first quarter now for an airline company most of the expenses are dollar denominated and a weaker rupee means that it, that they need to shell out more for these expenses lastly the only surprise factor in this quarter could be the compensations that the company has has been receiving from the engine maker that is Pratt and Whitney. Lastly, key things to watch out for would include the management commentary on volume growth and yields, any commentary related to induction of new aircrafts and on new related issues, any fuel price guidance that the company is giving and any updates on the company's plan on the long distance international routes would be a keen thing to watch out for. All right, we're watching out for Indigo's numbers as well. Uh, Samir, thank you for that. A new version of the Unified Payments Interface, or UPI, is expected to be rolling out next month. The upgraded version will have features like a one-time mandate, among other things. Vishwanath is standing by to take us through some of those details. Vishwanath. Right, Asha. So the uh, second phase of the UPI aims at, uh, I mean, firstly, it was supposed to bring in something known as a recurring mandate uh, sort of payment uh, mechanism, which which did not uh, which did not feature in the, in the final draft of the UPI 2.0, uh, primarily because the NPCI, which which is the agency that brings out this uh, this product, wasn't sure exactly how people are going to accept it and whether there are going to be any security concerns as far as recurring payment mandates go. So instead, what the NPCI has done is brought in this one-time mandate mandate wherein a customer would be allowed uh, to set aside a certain amount from their bank account before availing a service and immediately after the service has been availed then that payment goes across this will ensure that the uh, that the, uh, the customer has adequate funds uh, to pay for a service when they are uh, utilizing it apart from this they're also bringing uh, bring, bringing out uh, remittances which uh, inward remittances which would help their nri customers to send in money to family and other friends uh, back in india there's also going to be an invoice service 
service wherein you know UPI works both ways so if somebody wants to request for payment from some uh, from uh, from uh, from a, a customer then they can send an invoice on uh, the UPI app and then the customer can verify uh, that payment and then approve uh, the transaction uh, similarly th there are a few other uh, uh, specialized products that uh, UPI 2.0 will bring in uh, there'll be QR code um, and some other payment uh, mechanisms but of course the key factor the key uh, product which was supposed to come in the recurring mandate is not going to be part of the final product um, as the uh, sources are telling us at this point in time that by the second week of August is when we'll see the UPI 2.0 rollout actually happen Vishwanath many thanks for that out of time on the show, thank you so much for joining us today. Countdown is up next.